Let's hear it for Van Halen! Everybody, welcome back to Final Residence TV in episode number 32 of Van Halen Stories. Today, my guest is Gary Putman, all the way from Arcadia, California. There yeah. Close to Van Halen land, Pasadena area. Uh, Gary goes back with Van Halen back to the mammoth days, right? That, that'd be correct. Yeah. And then he was also in Dread Zeppelin with my other guest, Carl Jaw, who was on previously. And if you haven't seen Carl's episode, you need to go see it because I have a feeling that because these guys were bandmates, we're going to have this uh, intertwining of these stories a little bit, <laughs> you and him, right? I mean, through those, through some of those things you experienced together. I think so. I think there is I, some intertwining. For, for sure. So anyway, I, I, thanks for coming on, man. I, I you know, yeah. heard about you for a long time from my buddy Greg Renoff. Of course, when I talked to Carl, he was like, "You got, you got to get Gary. You got to get Gary." Yeah, I, I, yeah, I saw that. That was fun. I was just like, "Wow." Carl's episode is fantastic because we go through all different kinds of stories that he had, and you have a very similar experience, but a lot of them different stories. Starting back in in with Mammoth back in, or let me go back. You, how, how did you get to Arcadia, California? Did you always live there? Yes, I would. Yeah, I I always did. Just right down the freeway. If you're on the freeway, ninety seconds off the the two ten. And I was born in Altadena, which is right above Pasadena. With you know, so so yeah. that's so yeah, I was always there. You're pretty local to Pasadena area, and of course, grew up. But Van Halen's, and of course, Michael Anthony is from Arcadia. Yes, which, we, which we'll get probably get into that too. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So you you go back. When when was the first time you'd heard about Van Halen? I don't know if I can. Remember the first time, but you're talking about like, you mean as Mammoth or something like that? Like way yeah, earlier? Sure, sure. First time you saw him. It, I can't remember specifically, but I can, but I know that it was, you know, like a backyard party in El Monte or something. I, I can remember El Monte, which is really close to Arcadia and which is where I went to high school. Okay. You know, somebody must have said, you should see this band. It was a three piece and it was either, it was probably Mammoth or or Genesis, I can't, you know, can't remember now. You know, you just go into the parties and like this is a hot band. So that's how I must have seen them. And and the people would say though, you know, like we're gonna go see this band because this guitar player is unbelievable. But they also would say, I remember at the time, like you should see the fucking drummer because he's got he's got the double kick and he's, you know, he's not just your normal sort of Mustang Sally type of drummer. So to answer your question, the the introduction to them was all was was sort of sold to us as like. It's not just the guitar player, but the drummer's fun, like the best drummer you've ever seen. And they were right, you know. So do you recall that gig and, and what it was like, what they were playing? Yeah, yeah. I, re, I And I think I'm thinking of the drums because he he went, he did it. You know, you've heard this before. He did Toad. Mm -hmm. And the, so that they would do extending and it, and it must have been Eddie singing because there was no front man. And uh, it, it the, the, one of the ones that I remember is, like I said, in El Monte, which is in this area about, you know, about 11 minutes away down the street. And so it was a, an El Monte backyard party that I can, and I can still remember that, but then the, and then other, other similar type things start to come in, like up in Pasadena inside of a house that was a backyard. So the next time it's inside of a house, there was a keyboard player, but he didn't do much, a small keyboard. And, and then it was probably Mark Stone and Alex and Eddie and, and the thing that stands out that night, Jeff, is, is, as you're asking me, because I've never thought about this, was was instead of the Toad drum solo, he's doing not the clap and stuff, doing fucking Going Home, Alvin Lee. And just like some people say Alvin Lee is like the, the dawn of shred, like like that he was one of, like one of the first guys just like, uh, you know, I'm going to play so fast. So it was him doing that with that little extra Eddie attack sizzle that he has, you know, the little scrunching. And the intensity of his playing, right? With and I can P90s. I re, I remember a P90 gold top. I don't know if that's wrong because I know right. that King's pickups out. But I mean, that's right. P90 yeah. gold top. That was the first guitar he had, right? That first first ever, all like Les Paul. Yes, yes. Before anything was switched out or anything, I we I even saw him. God, I saw him with a with a with the Melody Maker, which is a double cut area with a with a not a humbucking. Not a single coil, not a P90, but a mini humbucking in the bridge position because it was always the bridge position that he cared about. Do you know, do you know this guitar? A I'm mini, on. a mini humbucker, just one wired in in the back position, but it's the it's the little deluxe Les Paul deluxe pickup. So I saw him. That's another time when you're asking me about the early stuff. Was 
I can, that's, that's what comes to mind when I think about that. It's just, just, uh, we talked about this before, just getting to that thing where you start to go see this band and, and I don't know what they were either mammoth or Genesis at this time still. And, and, and you'd go, I know the original version of that. I mean, I saw Woodstock, but this, this is like, there's something else here. That's, that's more fun. <laughs> you know, it's just more fun. And you, you were just saying that I, I that's that was your reaction. That's what you when you saw them play back then. Well, you said this when we talked offline that you know we we call it Van Halenized their covers or whatever. But yeah, that was something they were doing back in the in the backyard party days. You you would see that. Yeah, yeah. And, and like I said, think about it. Going home too, just like just and really, really, really more than doing it justice. And so that right. that's and then the, and then the whole band. I, I, honestly, when I think of when I I watch all the videos of. Everything, especially, you know, especially when they were with Ross and everything, you you could you could just tell that Michael Anthony knew that he had to be up to the task, but he was up to the task. He was one of them, and that's what made it work. It's just like, well, there's no, there's no weak link here, you know what I mean? And 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 I mean, I'm sure that the interviews with him where he's talking about like it was a it was a different animal when I got into that band than than the other bands that he was in, you know. Yeah, he was in state before that. Apparently, they took him up to this. Uh, took him up to this. Uh, uh, was it up in Altadena? There was a garage up there. They have I forget what this street is, but that's where Michael auditioned for the band and and then became the bass player from After Mark Stone. Wow, I, I you know I I don't know if it's the same place, but I think I had told you when we had talked previously that I I went to a couple of rehearsals in in that garage, and it sounds it sounds like same place. You know, what I, what I like that that picture that I have that I sent you. I, when I sent that, I thought like, how does anybody even believe that that happened now when people are are you know digitally changing things? Mm-hmm. But I, but I was there, I, and and it's, isn't it funny in hindsight? I can remember most of the time a closed back Marshall type cabinet, but in those days it was a lot of Fender basements and maybe even a bandmaster at times. It's like yeah, he, he had a white, I think it was a white bandmaster that he said he wrote a white bandmaster. And 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 God, I th- I don't know if Car- Carl had talked about that in your, no, your think... episode or not, but it's just like Carl was like the first guy to get that, and then Carl and I both had, and then I got one, and then Carl and I both got Variac. So we had, so we had, we had the, you know, when you think of that close back thing, you think of like a certain compression that it gives the sound. You know what I mean? I mean, I know that I I have a a fifty nine reissue right now that's an open back that sounds great, but I but back in those days. The way that he made it, that you thought of that close back cabinet as being such a part of it, of that womp, that 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 sort of voicing, that throat that it has, that's not that's all part of that warmth, but or brown or whatever, and, you know. And that didn't just happen with him. You know, Ronson's sound was the brown sound, and all those bitching, you know, Leslie West, you know, Leslie West in the early days had a. We love Leslie West, and you know, you think about. I was I was thinking about this too. We there was just a video or not a video, it was a video audio thing that was released of Mammoth, uh, recorded really well, and you could really hear how clean this sound was at this point in '72. It's was. a video. It's a, it's actually a, it's actually just put out by my friend Alan Barry on his tapes archive channel, and it's um it's a very clean uh, recording of Eddie singing too, uh, singing War Pigs. Oh, I have never heard that. That's the bands that I saw. That's the bands that we're talking about. Send it to you, but it's. I just listened to it last. I just. I just found it last night through a friend, and. Oh, I would love to hear that. It's so his it's, his sound, you know, is so crystal clear in it and clean. But you know, I'm pretty sure it's this bandmaster, one one of those. Right. Bands. But it was still able to muscle it out and to and to uh, you know. What you're describing is what I heard. This particular practice. You know, this, I don't remember very act super leads, you know what I mean? So it, it, I just remember that. And it was always just like, God, that's the sound, you know, that's, that's, I mean, that, or not, not that's the sound, but what a great sound that is. And, and it, you, of course it was more than just the sound. It was the, the way that he was scrunching. And <laughs> so when you're at these practices, like how many people are there with you? Just a few, just you guys. When, when, the, when I was taking the practice and I had told you this, Previously, when I talked to them, my friend that I keep saying was their first manager, he took me up there, and we and he's also the one that took them to Gazaris, where my brother drove them with their equipment. Which I told you before. Yeah, we'll get into this it, it, again. And I have I have a I have like a, a little group of these these things that are so precious to me, but I don't know how interesting they are to other people. That was just me, and his name is Mark, the manager guy. He goes, "You want to go up and see him practice?" And we went up, and it was uh, 
it was just me. I was the only one inside Mark, and he would just go up there to talk to them about something. You want to play San Marino High School Auditorium or whatever it was. So no, it was nobody else. And they were nice and they were always nice. And I didn't I didn't hang for hours, you know, I was just in there and he did his business and then we left, you know. But I I can so now and haven't even thought of that until you until I met you and, and probably Greg too, you know. So was Mark uh, was Mark booking all the gigs or what was or was Alex doing it? Because there's at that time I, at that time I guess he was and I and I I think so. He was there. It, it's a, that's all in Greg's book, you know, the, the Mark Algorian and uh, Mario Miranda, his partner. He wasn't with him very long, I don't think. But he, but but the remember the Cherokee demo? Yeah, that's Mark Algori. He paid for that and took them, and we would hear that and and just going. Just going, God damn, listen to this, you know, even though it was more raw and more like album oriented or, you know, like album, like simple rhyme type stuff rather than I can't wait to feel your love tonight. The pop, the pop aspect. He had some he was doing stuff with them. I don't know exactly what. Like I said, I took him to Gazzari's and that's how I and that's how I found out let's about talk, all that. Let's talk about Gazzari's. And I, want, I do want to get to the pickups discussion in a minute, but let's let's talk about Gazzari's that you're on that subject now. You loaded. You helped them load in at Gazars, is that right? Or you went with? No, them? no. I I wasn't there. My brother. My I have. I'm the I'm the I'm the youngest of four. I don't know what the timeline is, but they had, they were both in Vietnam. They came back, and I and I had a, so one of my brothers was like this surf bum, just like he was in Playgirl magazine and everything. And so Mark knew him too. We all knew my brother. So I I wasn't there that time. Later on in the day, I found out that Mark. That they needed a ride for some reason, you know, and they, so Mark took them to audition at Gazari's, and that's where I told you that my brother carved his name in the cement in front of Gazari's at that time. So I wasn't there on that one. I just heard about it that night from my brothers, and then the next day from Mark because Mark and I used to go surfing. And did you say that the Van Hillens put their name in the concrete that night as well? Yes, they, they, the whole band, and this is with Roth. I think Mark was just like, "This is early Roth, right?" Yeah. I had previously told you it was there for years. I like, there's my brother, the rest of them all just in small little, like with a, with a twig or something right in front of the doors of Gazari's. And then, and then, and then later on, it there was a tree with a grate over it. You know how they do that. And then at some point years later, it, cause so since nobody knew because that was my brother, they, they tore it out and it's not there anymore, but it was there for years. Wow. My brother didn't, you know, didn't know that, and I didn't know them either. I didn't know who they were, but he, he just that day he hung with them that whole day because he had a surfer VW band and took them down and they auditioned at Gazari's and they got the job. That was when they went for the first time, one time, that was it for Gazari's. You know, when you make me think of that concrete, you make me think of that place over over there by their house where that's they had written Van Halen in the concrete. Yeah, same kind of thing. Yeah the liquor store so they, they must have that must have been a thing for them kind of like that you know yeah no yeah and, and, and the timing though I, I just remember honestly it, and especially as as you know the subsequent years came by i was like i would it would come back to my mind and go you know my brother put his name in the cement with with them over you know at, at gazari's you know and it's just like nothing, nothing was ever made of it you know you, you know it, but it was there for it was there for a number of years until they redid the whole sidewalk and everything with the trees and grates and stuff like that. whole nine yards yes that's, that's my recollection so you saw them at Gazzari's or you did yeah we oh god we played with them oh. we, we played with we played with them a lot and that's where uh and the guy that I still play with I've mentioned before Jimmy Volpe who was in Smile and who played with Steve Stevens for a while and was in the David Lee Roth band for two weeks. <laughs> That's a whole story. But anyway, we we would we would we had a band, a cover band, right. and we played with them all the time. We were always like on the upstairs stage or the small, you know, we were always like okay. right from the very beginning was kind of like there's other bands and then there's Van Halen. <laughs> and right, right. So you you played you played with them at Gazzari. So many times we did it, and they were doing some originals, but they were doing like Ross said get down tonight and stuff like this. And it was just like so full sounding Jeff. It's, it's just like, because of that sort of like frequency that the guitar was taking up, there's no more room in the musical part. Sure. You know, you can put vocals on top and you can have your rhythm second, but it was just like that, that whopping sound that would just sound, it was so throaty, but not harsh. Right, right. And I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to address the brown sound. I know that, I know what they mean by that. It was just like, I was always trying to make his equipment not work right. Right. Isn't that what a very a, a variac is? It's like 
And I would think of like all these bitching guitar sounds like me. I know he has his icon series and his 5150, but it but his equipment was like he was making it work wrong. Like we're starving the power of the tubes. And that's what that's what Brian May sounds like. Wasn't it a little transistor radio that was like that's yeah. not really designed for guitar, but it, but things were happening that were not supposed to happen because things were inefficient. That's what it that's what those sounds remind me of, you know. I was gonna go, go back to guitars a little bit. Okay. Now, when you when you played there with him, now Greg told me that you were preview to the dance contest. What about the dance contest? Did you see those with Rob? Oh God, all the time. I, I mean all <laughs> But that we we uh, again I yes and and, <laughs> and that's why I can't stress enough about he would be doing the dance contest and he would go I, I told I know I told you this but I'm gonna tell you because this is how Roth was and why for me I was I was just like this guy's the business he's it would he go it, it, also it's time to feature Eddie he's gonna do the solo and he would scream out I know I told you this I he scream out goes Hitler had the V2 rocket. We've got Edward Van Halen. And like I, and like I said before, it's Edward Van Halen, not Eddie Van Halen. And, and we would just go, the, the, the V2 rocket, that's part of the Blitzkrieg that they... <laughs> it's like, <laughs> did he say that? And then we thought, like, well, he's Jewish, so I get... You know, I get <laughs> right, right. I'm like, God, Jeff, I swear to God, I, 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 could, I could go on with the same crazy magic enthusiasm that we have for Van Halen about Roth. Give me some Roth stuff because I, you know, I, I don't, I don't feature Roth as much as I probably should. But Roth was, it's, it's too cliche, but I have to use it to say that we've never seen anything like it. We use, we, for, for that kind of music, we saw them all, Jeff. We were at, I think I saw Zeppelin seven times, all that heavy music. And we saw Sabbath, we saw Grand Funk Railroad, all that kind of shit that would lead you to that. And 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 even to this day, I go to you know bands like Rings of Saturn and Meshuggah and these bands that are eight string, just fucking marvels of technicality. Mm -hmm. I've never in my life, because of Roth, seen anybody just come out and even if even if the Mahavishnu Orchestra can play faster, they came on the stage with such an unbelievable heavy energy. That that it, it, that it that it it was just adding to the performance so, so much it was Zeppelin I saw them with great good great band look at that drummer Jimmy Page but there was this whole different dynamic that that Roth brought to it and it's it's all common knowledge now that, that there's sort of like wry wry comedy they were throwing where he's criticizing people but he's trying to be funny but he's, he's sometimes he's doing it at other people's ex expense. Sure. Like I said, some of the, the people, like he would do such politically incorrect stuff at Gazari's, he would go, this guy would sort of look like he was from like a, like like the South Seas and Roth would go, looking like something out of National Geographic magazine, Russell. And then Russell would be going, thanks, Dave. And <laughs> everybody would laugh because he was, he was, he was making fun of people. The, the, the Roth, the Roth thing is overwhelming and, 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 and it, and it seems when people get into the discussion about Van Halen, it seems like somebody's trying to be intellectual by, by talking about the contributions of the other members. And like, we all know about Eddie, but Roth was, was Eddie on fucking as the lead vocalist. Where, the, where he would scream and two things, two sounds would come out at once. What the fuck is that? Right. And just his musicality. And it's such a cliche, but of course, combined with Eddie, that's all, that's the shit that we love the most. Roth was, Roth was, we had, never seen anything like it and we're all just like again not to try to be humble or anything because i you know we I, I i still think we're i think what we do is great and everything like that but it'd just be like why why would we we shouldn't even be on this bill <laughs> because there was, there was this other element of of the, that guitar player is pretty good i've never seen that before he just stuck the head stuck up his ass and fucking played them you know i was like i was like he was just doing shit that was unbelievable when you're so used to just like jimmy page is a great guitar player but so is that guy he has his own style but so does that guy eddie was just like what what the fuck right. and and so so roth roth was so a part of, of that i told when i talked to you before i talked about this culture of man halen and it that would have been just more of you know Eddie and his music, and that's all. There was all this other shit, and I'm and you were asking me the, the, this. Qu your question to me was describe Roth. Mm -hmm. It's like it was it was magical in the same way that Eddie was magical with Roth, and I, I, I'm that's how I that's my experience with it. 
And then, every, and then everybody else, you know, Michael, Anthony would, and Alex would go, well, Roth is doing his Roth things, and now I'm going to do my fucking thing. And then Michael found his over-the-top niche way of performing, and, and right? He's, he's a fucking unbelievable performer. Mm-hmm, right. And, and, and it's because it's like, it's like you, to me, to me, this, this is, this is, this is it. And you can edit this out because you're talking <laughs> makes me think about this is I've, I've heard this analogy before. I heard, I heard Iggy Pop make this analogy, if, even if it's even related. And it's like, I feel like Van Halen were the, the, the comparison was like, you have four puppies in a box. And all of them are dying for you to pick them and want to be noticed. It wasn't really so much about we're playing as a band. My vibe was not, it wasn't playing as a band because I, I've seen that and I've, I've been, I've been that. Right, right. To me, it was like, look at fucking me. And, but somehow, and my contribution, what I'm going to try to do is to try to get me noticed more than Eddie or Roth. That's what I saw. And I'll, I'm just telling, that's what I see. And, and, and in hindsight, we hear a song, we hear a pop song, but those songs come out of that dynamic as far as I'm concerned. And it's like, it's immature, it's fucking childlike, and that's why I fucking love it. It's so <laughs> over the top. It's like, that's not, that's not, I love the Doobie Brothers. I, 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 that's not the Doobie Brothers or, or Pablo Cruz. That's just like, that's just like mayhem. And they're like, and, and Iggy Pops had said this for a pick me. And because because of what they're doing at that time of their lives, there was so much energy and so much just talent in every way, not just music, but just every, every you know, virtuosity that Michael Anthony's a fucking, he plays that all this fucking picked out shit. It's like, are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> I'm lucky just to fuck the eighth of those, you know, really. So anyway, that's, that's where that Roth question led me to, is that Roth had to do that and wanted to do that. Like you have, a, you have, that that was the other thing I was going to say. There's never been a guitar player that's fundamentally changed, you know, guitar. There just hasn't in, in, in the world, not just pop music or rock music. And you can talk about, spe- but without special effects or delays or sort of pedals or anything like that, just like I, I, I'm, I'm turning the guitar, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to break the neck and then start playing. And what's going to come out is bitching. And you're just like, that's what Eddie did. What you're saying is Van Halen within that context at that time, was so far outside the box, like you said, Zeppelin, all of those things, and then they hit, and it's like it's hard for anybody who's not who's not there to understand how it was at that time, like you said about rock. That's that's exactly that's that's so. I mean, when we're talking about this, and we're trying to just for our own entertainment get some real something like substantive out of it, something that really means something. It's like that's that's the thing that comes back that's exactly as you worded it how i think of it as, and when we start talking about this about 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 the execution about this uh, you i don't care even even if it were today there's, there's a i seen i'm i still go to these metal concerts all the time i go i, I see all the bands and, and bands that are crazy the dillinger escape plan where the guy cuts himself and all these all these fucking bands and I and and e- even if they were to play what they were doing, what we saw, backyard parties and and everything on, everything on, mm-hmm. what was your experience was more intense than just Mushuga playing and their bitch and I love Mushuga. Doesn't doesn't compare to me. I still have the same perspective when I see bands. It's just like electric guitar, bitch and let's go. That's it. It's just I'm a kid, just like you. They had that Van Halen culture or that thing that was. I know every band wants to kill and every band wants to fuck the other band up and, and be those, but they truly somehow that combination truly had it. And that's what, that's what we felt. And we all talk about it. I mean, Carl, you know, Carl was talking the last time. It's funny. We all talk about our, you know, our own experiences. We've had some pretty good experiences of our own. You know, they were notable to us, but it's like, but, but we're all like, we all we all think of Van Halen when we think about the ultimate of that, and then but you're sort of part. If you're a fan, you're kind of a part of that. You know, you're right, right. right that's right. why. That's a, that's what's amazing is that that it did. That's why I do this, you know, because I want yeah. people to recognize, you know, like yourself and and Carl that went back to this period with them. You know, you were there to see that kind of, and it's not only at the at the time and its form, but within the context of the rest of the world in those other bands that you saw. 
at that right. time. In Pasadena Civic, you and I talked about this. You said, did you play at PCC as well at the college? Pasadena PCC. Uh, I played one one gig with them at Pasadena City College. One called Harvison Hall. I told you. I, I previously you and I had talked in the yeah. Tell, the tell Battle of the that. Bands, and it was right. It was. I'm telling you, near the timeline is five weeks after Roth joined. You know that, and that was when it was. And we were all just like, <clears throat> and and it was Van Halen. He had just joined, but enough to where they were, they could play out. You know, probably did, probably didn't take them that long to you know to get to get some songs with Dave that they could play out. Mm -hmm. And I was with this band, the, the band, I, band I was called Mighty Joe Young. It wasn't, it wasn't with Jimmy, it was even with guys. So it's earlier, right? Cause Roth had just joined. Yeah. So it was called Harvest and Hall. It's still there. A nice little small auditorium with like wooden floors and stuff. And, and, and they had got, they had just gotten Roth and we were like, okay, we'll play our set. And then they came out with Roth and we're, we're already, doing what we had talked about earlier in this, in this, in this uh, conversation of like, it was, they were already kicking the doors down. You know what I mean? Like, and by that, I just, I mean, every, in every way, just stunning musicality, stunning tone, everybody always, ev I mean, you know, you, you know, better than me, like the drums and the fucking bass were just as substantial, you know, and just as throaty and, and wouldn't have them any other way. I and mean, then that's, Easy to say in hindsight, but that's but you were thinking that at the time. There's nothing that's not so fun about this band. That was Harvest and Hall, Battle of the Bands. They won. There was like <laughs> four bands, little flyers printed up. I, I look at it every day that I drive by it, and I'm I'm two minutes away. And then the, the, the Civic shows where they have that plaque that's out there now uh, was with a, I played it. I don't know how many, uh, uh, more than one. You know, I don't know how many. We all we all saw the. Jeff, the smoke bombs where you take the filament and put inside a coffee can. And then that was the first time we'd ever seen that. And we went, and I, we might've seen that at a black Sabbath show if you went to the forum, but we never saw that on a local level. And they're like, they're white, they're winding fucking film. And they got the coffee cans with a wood thing. And then there'd be the two things and you would put it and they put the gunpowder in there. And I remember that in the same way that I would remember, like how's he adjusting his springs for his whammy bar. Cause by that time we all had Charvel's. We all, Carl and I had very and We were, I have to say this for Carl and I, other than Eddie, we were the next two guys that copied him first. <laughs> Swear to God. And then, and then bandmaster heads of, and then doing, and then everything. And then Carl getting a guitar with a P90 pickup that Carl is such an unbelievable player. It's just an executioner and original style player that he was able to use P90s in the same way that, you know that that we would think that Eddie did with a with a non high gain amp. I, I still think there's something to, to non high gain amps that are that are goosed in some crude primitive way. So anyway, so that's where that came from. We saw and and so at the Civic, that's probably the first time I saw that, or or maybe not the first time, but we certainly I certainly in my mind of, of them, you know, doing that and then and then taking a song that there was a good song by Kiss like Firehouse and yeah. and and. With one guitar player sounding thicker and edgier and more fun, and and then like, oh god, he's gonna go off on his solo. Can you imagine the solo? But do, can, let me ask you this: I as as I as time goes on, I get way way more aware, at least to me, of how much of an influence Kiss was on Van Halen. Yeah, I think so. I, there, there's oh a lot. There's, there's Songwriting wise, just the, the American hard rock man, the the flamboyant show, you know. Oh. Yeah, well, of course. I think you know there's a lick that he did he did in the early eruption versions that you hear that that when I put it up because I hadn't heard anybody put a video up on this lick. It's a it's kind of a backwards fourth thing where he crosses over and he does this hammer. I'll bet you I'll bet you I'd know if I heard it. And it goes straight. It's just kind of a, it's literally a, like a chromatic thing he does all the way up the neck, and it gets up to this insane speed that just blows your mind. Yeah, and I was like on my post i was like i don't know where this lick came from and somebody said that's ace that's an ace freely lick and oh uh, my God. i was thinking yeah you're probably right you know yeah. it's, it's kind of like the all right now lick but reverse i understand yeah that's and that style of playing i mean think about it i, I it, it's it's only as time has gone on that i i really i really i really feel that that they were uh, you know, obviously they're their own thing, but you know, we all we all know Black, you know, Led Zeppelin and Aerosmith and Black Rock Arkansas and all the different bands that they like, ZZ Top, all that. But that that Kiss too, Kiss were what way before Van Halen, you know, and it's just like 
they were they they were they didn't they didn't necessarily have the virtuoso thing that Richie Blackmore had or somebody that we would just go great song but also a virtuoso. Mm -hmm. But but they but their presentation was like that's sort of like the uh, like a Van Halen template for me. Obviously with their own ultimately personalities coming in, but that's like Kisser. You know, the way that they would rock back and forth and shit. They got all that from Kiss, you know? Of course, yeah, you know, and, and, and of course, Gene got involved with them. And, and, and that's yeah, what, you know, he, that's right. right. And, then, and and him getting involved, is, it makes perfect sense. It's like, you have every right to, to think that you can guide these guys. Because it's like, you guys are kindred spirits, you know? Yeah, I, think I, really, I really have grown to like Kiss a lot more. Well, and then... Yeah. I mean, I, I grew up, you know, I think the first time I ever kind of like uh, grasped onto electric guitar was when I heard just Ace, you know, with his Les Paul doing just the vibrato when he holds single note. Oh, yeah. I just thought that was the cool. I mean, as a kid, I didn't know what that was, but I just thought it, it was, was an electric cool. guitar. It was, so it had that it had the little the compression and everything that we were talking about earlier. Right. Those aspects of the guitar. Yeah. It just, it just, oh, my God. It just yeah. touched me, man. It touched me in a way that I can't I can't really. I can't, still can't really tell you. I know, I, I know, and it's just like it's, it's, it's. I, I, I know, I know what you're, I know what maybe, you're saying. You know, maybe too. You know, this is something I brought up. I think last time I just talked to somebody about this. When Ace Freely would solo, okay, he would do a, a tapping thing with his pick, and he would do something very similar to what Eddie ended up. Maybe it was less on the left hand and more with his right hand. But using the pick on the neck. Yeah, and and I had seen that. I saw them live in 79, but I had seen it before, I think. Uh -huh. so when I first discovered Van Halen, I was kind of like, I kind of already knew that thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, right, you had I kind of figured out, oh, that's well, that's how they done. But I knew Eddie was different. I knew it was quite different than what he did, but, yeah. but I kind of knew by hearing it what it was. Yeah, no, but you're right. Those are the those are the seeds of it, right? Or or the the nascent or whatever the word is that that. Well, Greg, you know, Greg brought up to me and he showed me some, he sent me a video of Derringer, Rick Derringer. You know, there was all these big talks about Eddie being pissed at Rick Derringer for copyright. Yeah, yeah copyright, right? But these videos show Derringer and his bandmate doing some rudimentary tapping and also doing the behind the, the cable behind the hand trick that you would see Eddie do later, you know. Oh, like, like and if that would have been maybe before Eddie? was it was 76 i've seen oh video. my god that, that well that's interesting too you know yeah like a lot of, a lot of things you know harvey mandel's story of course that, that goes around and around over the, and you're part of the world with uh terry kilgore and, and yeah I, I just thought, i just talked to terry today yeah so you know yeah that whole story you know because eddie was kind of like he got it from he said he got it from jimmy page at the at the thing at the smithsonian which i was i was at he, oh, yeah, I know. You, were short, you sent me the picture. And, I oh, was man. there. So he, he had said that about where he got it. Of course, when I interviewed Matt Black at the guitar player, he said that there was a book, which I have, a very early 85 book of Eddie Van Halen, like a, a biography on him. And in that book, Neil Sean's interviewed, and this is in 85, and Neil Sean recounts that he, in 78, asked him where he got the tapping from. This is backstage 78 tour. Yeah. Sean said that Eddie Van Halen said, oh, there was a guy named Harvey Mandel that used to do some of that, right? Now, he never went on record saying this any, in any other. No, oh, but, but he said that's what Neil, Neil says. That's what he told him. That's what he said. And then when Matt Blackett was at a Jeff Beck show, he ran into Neil Sean. And Neil Sean goes, hey, Matt, come here. I want to introduce you to the guy who, who Eddie Van Halen got tapping from. And it was Harvey Mandel. <laughs> this is probably, I don't know, maybe 15 or 20, 15 years ago, probably, I think, that Matt had been at that Beck show. And right. Said that. So that story, at least from Neil Sean's point of view, is the story. Wow. So I, I hope one day I get Neil on here and I can, like, really score him on oh, it. No, yeah, he, he I, I, you know, that's that's funny. But the, the, when I see that, you know, the clips of guys like that, uh, that were involved in the, the ultimate umbrella of what we're talking about, Van Halen, yeah. was Neil Schoen. And then there's others too, but uh, uh, actually Chris Holmes, George Lynch. Yeah. They're, at this point, when they talk to him, they're so reverent and have such reverence and such respect for, for that. They're all like, are you fucking kidding me? They were, they were, we all were trying to, you know, and it's okay to say that everybody has their ins inspirations and none of them copied. 
I mean, Steve Vai is considered his own guitar player. Joe Satriani, and these guys all tap. Cannibal Corpse, every one of their riffs is a tapped riff. You know, it's like, but it's like, but that, but that's just because it's like almost like just regular picking, whatever the whatever the normal style is. It's like that's okay. It's okay now. I mean, you know, Steve Vai. Yeah. Well, the down to you know the down the uh, I kind of like go through this whole period of thing. Uh, this is something that you could probably help me with because before. As far, you know, when I got into guitar, it was because I saw the Unchained video. And I really think it was because I the heard one, the Oakland one. Yeah. And yeah. I really think it's because I heard Drop D for the first time. And I never heard anything like that, like that drop tuning. Now I realized later, of course, I think it Queen had it on uh, Fat Bottom Girls. There was yeah. probably some Zeppelin stuff that I'm not aware of right off the top of my head that was dropped. I mean, it maybe even goes back to the blues guys. I mean, I don't know how far this goes back, but 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 when Eddie did it, of course, like everything else Eddie did, it kind of popularized it for for a while. And then Steve Vai comes forward with the seven string, right? Yes. The and then this whole them. thing, this whole thing explodes with multi scale and multi string. And, right, right. I've got a multi scale eight eight. <laughs> right. So it's like. It's like these things, they just, they become inspiration points along the line that turn into the other things like you're talking about. Yeah. You know, and that all comes from like, you, you said, we we're talking about Eddie and how many of the things came from Eddie. You know, we're going to talk about your picture up at 5150. Yeah, that, I'm gonna, I had a, a few times up there uh, over my life. I'll tell you, I'll tell you exactly the, the two that come to mind, the two main biggest ones. Um, that was during the recording of OU812. So oh, you have to look to see what year that was. And then the other time was Alex was mixing right here, right now, which is their live album. And I was with Alex at 5150 and he was editing the video, not mix, not mixing. He was editing video. He wasn't mixing it. It was already mixed. So both those times are Sammy mid nineties. Right. Right. And when, in that, wouldn't that be. Early mid yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, so the, the, let's go, let's go to those, those moments where you were with, the band at, at oh, 50 this is the kind of stuff that's like but like like i feel like a little kid and everybody else was like well i wasn't there it doesn't mean shit well, to me no it does mean shit to everybody because everybody but, would love to be there and, and it had looking back is crazy it's look crazy. at me I, dude i would be just just <laughs> i love to do this thing is something i can talk to people about going to pitch yeah no no i know that's cool <laughs> I, lo I love so it tell me tell me these these two stories in detail of going to 5150 how do you end up with the van halen's at 5150 uh that that time okay okay how about the first one people that are like deep divers or what or rabbit holders know that that eddie's wife valerie had a great friend in a band called private life signed to warner brothers records yep. you familiar with it yeah okay they made i think they made two records but the first record they're making i've never actually told this story before i've, I've told the story of me being up there but how i got up there yeah or how i how i get up there these times and and so he's like they're not recording it there we're recording at a studio in, in hollywood somewhere like amigo or you know what or a and m or whatever it was at the time a and m and so if you look at the picture the guy on the far right is um in in that picture he was the bass player in private life okay he was also in dread zeppelin this band that we that carl and joe and tortellus and joe and all of us had which took up our life for like 20, took my life up 25 years. You know, yeah, I finally stopped after touring. Um, so all these different lineups from touring and people quitting and nervous breakdowns and everything. But I, I never, I made every show. And so he became the bass player, Jeff. Okay. Yeah. He's in private life, but he's also Donny Osmond's bass player. He's, I know you, if you play electric guitar, you have to know about Frank Gambale. Yeah, of course. He's Frank Gambale's bass player on the best records on Note Worker, Thunder from Down Under. That's Steve Krasinski, the guy in the picture. He joins Dread Zeppelin. He's like, I fucking love it. Like he he said, he plays with with Frank. He plays with the Chick Corea sometime. So he's in Dread Zeppelin now. So he goes, come up, but he calls and tells him, I'm bringing I'm bringing Gary up. This thinks that's what he, you know, and I'm gonna go up. And I need to talk to Ed about something on the Private Life record. So that's how I got up there. So that's that time, and it was just kind of a hang, and and that's the, that's the fifty one fifty where, in that picture, we're looking towards the control room. It's on the other side of the wall, the control, room, and the, we're looking towards Pasadena from 
uh, you know, from that off ramp that you get off to get to, to where he lives up there. Yeah, Studio City. Yeah, yeah. Sammy was Sammy was there. In and out. It says in and out. It wasn't that that long, but enough to where he was there just casually. And he's like, they. So Steve, he said, I'm bringing Gary up from Dred Zeppelin, and and they said bring him up. They were trying to get us to open for their Western shows and and on their tour at that time, in for Van Halen, have Dreads up and open up. That's what that's how they said bring him up. They knew me, they know my face, but I'm not close with them. But they knew that band, and and they and they. Uh, this is Sammy now, I, I, as I recall saying. But the record company said because um, Alice and Change are are way higher in the charts than you guys. We were like a hundred you know we were just we were charting but not not that high not nearly that high ever but still we were charting and uh so that was why we went up there and and, and, and but it was really more because steve krishnik that bass player frank and Bally's dred zeppelin bass player also the bass player in private life which i think those records are bitching because because jeff that's danny johnson who who the drummer i'll be playing with tomorrow night that's jimmy volby was the drummer in in, in his band when he was in California, it's all it's all connected. So that's so that's what that that trip was. So you went up there and you and you hung out with him. Did you get to do anything other than? I, I I didn't hang out a lot with him. This is yeah. just to show you how deep and and if you're you're the true deep diver that I know you are. <laughs> that same day, so so that that day, so Eddie's in and out. He's not just like it's he does, you know he just knows my face. He's not he never like hey Gary. He just he's but he's always let me come in. Valerie bust us in. At one of the things, because Steve was meeting with Eddie. So Steve was meeting with Eddie. Eddie's producing Private Life. Eddie's the producer, right? So they talk, but then they come out, and then Steve's talking to somebody else, and, and, and like one of the engineers or something up there, about the Private Life. Eddie takes me in. This is one of the times. I can't remember anything. He takes me and says, Eddie and I into the studio, which is, you've heard notoriously, there's a lot of cigarette butts and Schlitz malt cans around, and the old... It looks like an airplane. It's just me and him. Like the, he was, I could, I could start crying. You know, my friends would laugh. And it's like, but he was so nice to me. And I was such a fan of guitar and him. He's like, so all of a sudden, you know, shit that you still to this day can't believe. And I'm again, remember I'm exaggerating a little bit here. He's like, he plays black and blue, the track black. So this is all you wait until he plays. He sits me down, he plays for it and he cranks it. Cause they always crank it. Right. And I'm so now I'm looking towards Pasadena 5150. The picture you see is just behind that wall where there's pinballs. It's the little reception room. And he goes, uh, he plays the whole fucking song. And he goes, I swear to God, Jeff, he goes, I don't know. I, I don't I'm trying to do it, Eddie. He's like, I don't know about that solo. He goes, what do you think? And I swear, I was like, sounds pretty good to me. <laughs> so that's what I remember. There's a lot, there's probably more, but that's that was the, the trucks of that. And the other, so that was one of the times. The other time. One of the other times I was up there, oh, oh, the other time was the very day that Eddie played for Jeff Pacaro's tribute at the Universal Amphitheater. So he was in and out, in and out. So I was with Alex. I believe I have this time thing right, but it, it, it's all real, even if the time frame's not exactly right. So Eddie's in and out. And then eventually after coming in and out and just sort of, you know, humoring me, he goes, I got to go up the hill. I'm playing, I'm, I'm playing uh, with these bands for the, for this benefit. For Lucather and all that. Yep. Yes, that was when I was when I shared that, you know, those, that afternoon, you know, a couple of hours or whatever, just that when you're there, they're like, they don't even question it. They're so like, I know your face. You, you got buzzed in. You're here. This, this just like you'd, you'd hope that it would be. Right. And, and that was and it was Alex. And he's, and he's editing the video for right here, right now, which is the live album and playing it. And I'm watching it with him. And what do you think? You know, just noticing stuff. One of the times Wolfbang's crawling over me and Valerie's like, I'm sorry, she's apologizing, he's crawling on my fucking leg because he's out there with Alex and, and me. Right. This is great, right? A crawling baby. Right. And so so um anyway, to finish that story up, he goes, um, he asked, I don't know where it came or maybe it was, they probably had the, the fixings inside. So he makes it like a strong cup of coffee and he gives me a cup and I go, I really like coffee too. Because I was in the I was in the Navy in the Naval Reserve from 1971 70, and I made coffee. That was what I did. <laughs> So, so I made coffee and he, um, Alex goes, he sipped it. He goes, ah, that first cup of coffee and that first sip of coffee. And I'm like, yes, me too. And <laughs> at the, so Alex was done. He was done partying. They weren't partying. And 
anyway, so that's those are the 5150 um, in a nutshell, 5150. And then there's these other stories that Carl kind of went on. Something about you went to the Friends and Family rehearsal in 07. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, that was the first time. Yeah, I, 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 I and that one I snuck into. I wasn't invited to that. They didn't, you know. And I, I, I snuck into, it's called Center Staging, right over in Burbank, you know, not very far from that whole world over there, right, right. by the Burbank airport. And that, yeah, that was, yeah, that was just me sneaking in because I have white hair and they're thinking this guy works here or something like that. And stepping in, inside the doors and knowing that this is their reunion with Roth. And it was really hot. It was like really bad heat wave over here. The door was open, green metal flake drum set. And I stepped in on the other side and I stood next to Valerie and, and they played. And, and I think I told you this last time, Eddie didn't even see me. There was other people around too. There were other friends watching and I just stepped inside and kind of lost it too. Cause I was like, I'm fucking, these people are all, they're so ultimately sweet that they're like, if somebody doesn't kick you out, they figure you belong there. So that was another time. That was, a, that was, a, if that's what you're asking about, I think. Yeah, it was full, it was full rehearsal with the full fucking full amps and everything. And I was right in front of them and they were just like, I so to me, I was singing, I was already singing the reunion. Right. They're fucking going through the shit. I told you before, my friend Abel, who plays drums, who's actually played drums in corn and is on tour with Pantera's Charlie's Drum Tech. And it's the stand-in if they, I told this before, if Charlie goes down, this guy that, that we play with here is the drummer for Pan, for Pantera. That's, that's name dropping and loading all this shit. But I just wanted to do the connection. So he's the one that came over to the to Arcadia where we played with him. And he's like, dude, they're fucking at center staging. But when I found out the next day, I just went the next day. And I snuck in knowing that I could get in trouble. And I, I have, you know, so anyway, that's, that's what that was. I, that was, he was just giving me the heads up and I just snuck into the rehearsal and they didn't kick me out. They didn't fucking kick me out. So what was it? What it was it like? I mean, how close were you to the stacks and to their gear? I was right in front of it. So let me see. I was 20 feet away. I was standing right in front of Roth. There, there's a door, the door entered into both of it. So you're looking right at the, directly at the center. Wow. And I watched them rehearse. And the Carl story that you told, I Pretty accurate. I remember it being a little bit longer, a little more songs. I don't know if Carl remembers Eric Martin walking into this. This, and then this um, is what year is this, though? This is a different year. Right? This, this would have been, this is rehearsal practice for Monsters of Rock at, at the fucking Coliseum. 88. So, so it must have been sort of OU812E type shit. And, All right, that's right. and yeah. Carl told the story, and I think his is pretty accurate because I have the tendency to embellish everything. And But, but with some truth to it, we watched, I remember a number of songs and I, and I would, I would go upstairs. It was the same room that Michael Jackson would, would, what do they call it? Showcase in a pretty big rehearsal studio, not huge, but so I had upstairs thinking, and I, and I, we kept looking at each other going, this isn't fucking happening. Cause we, cause we had gone down there uninvited, snuck into the lobby of this place. I told you this, Carl goes, I'm going to sneak in. If I don't get kicked out in 10 minutes, come in. He doesn't get kicked out. I go in, we're standing in the lobby in the lobby that connects all these studios at mates and Michael Anthony comes out and says hi to both recognizes both of us talking to Carl but right at the end of the conversation he goes he looks at me and goes I'll go get Ed <laughs> and, and Carl Carl looks at, looks at me like what are you fucking talking about you know like oh yeah like like that's my good friend Ed right. so my, so Michael goes back in but this is how it happened brings Eddie out and Eddie comes out and apologizes for only having Jolt Cola do you guys want to come in and watch us fucking rehearse? And so I remember, you know, I, I can't remember something, but I remember it been going on for a while. Like we saw a number of songs that's it's over. So that's whatever they need to do. Oh, so what, and while that's happening, Eric Martin walks in, who's a good friend of Sammy Hager because they're both, um, they're both San Francisco guys. Right. Isn't, isn't, doesn't Sammy have a home up there or something like that. Yeah, that's right. And says hi. And then, and then somebody introduced us. Like, I don't know if it was Eddie. Like, these are my friends. I don't know if he said, I don't know. <laughs> but we, we were, they were playing a show. They did. No matter how many songs they played, they played for just Carl. It was just Carl and I. Wow. We get, they get done, and Eddie's kind of in a rush, but he invites us up on stage, and he gives Carl the guitar, the fucking H&H &H Power Amps. This is that era. So I'm thinking it's still 5150 or OU812. And he, and he. Um, this is the, this Carl, is this is the 5150 guitar, right? This, this red and white stripe. Yes. Yeah. That's it. the most iconic of them all, right? Well, there's all the, the, the original and then there's the 5150 played in that era. 
Yeah, I, I think I think, and and I'm, it really has to fit the number fifty one fifty on it, right? Yep. And so, so, and and again, maybe I'm just like wishful thinking, but it, he gives Carl and Carl, I, I and Carl started to play just to get the feel of it because Eddie's like play through my rig, and a string did break, and it was, and then it wasn't long after that he was he was apologizing for you know for for detoxing and everything. He was sober, and and we had Joe Colas, and we're like thank you for that, and then. And then he was it just like, oh, yeah. And I didn't finish the other one when I was up there with Alex editing the videos for the for the right here, right now. Eddie goes, I can now I have to go. He was there for a while and was visiting with me, just niceties. And then he was up the things that he was gone. And this same way, people were people came in and were pulling at him like, you got to go here now. It wasn't just like, I'm just going to go have a fucking hamburger. It's like he they were on a schedule. And so but so that on that particular one invited us in played for us just Carl and I and Carl and I looked at each other a number of times going this isn't fucking happening and I, and I went upstairs and I go I'm looking at them from up here it's just they're just playing for you and me <laughs> and and then gave got on stage gave Carl the guitar because he knew he was the better guitar player but uh, <laughs> but he appreciated my skills whatever I had and so and Carl and a string breaks and it was just kind of like it wasn't like oh I'll get you another guitar he, he was he needed to get on to his next thing, and so he left. He left not soon after that. Right, because it was like I think uh, yeah, Carl said. Yeah, like, but but still, the experience I, is just, I can't I believe it. it's logical, you know. Right, like he said, the tech just grabbed the guitar and walked away. <laughs> like, uh, okay. Yeah, maybe maybe maybe, that, maybe that's what happened. Yeah, the that's, tech, that's, that's all. That's your one chance to play any guitar. I know, I know, <laughs> but but just the fact that he just like shoves it at Carl and goes here play, I was like, it's it just like that's fucking unbelievable. <laughs> You know, like what? You know, like, like, like instead of instead of you know, I like that stuff so cool. It was you know, like instead of going like sitting down and go watch, I'm going to play my new tapping. You know, <laughs> he gives right. it to Carl, and I, I can remember just the lighting. I can, you know, you can really remember a lot of stuff about that. You know, let me ask you about this though. If you go back, you know, how did you? I mean, from what I remember about Carl's interview, it's been a while. You guys kind of met him all through the years. Like y'all, you, you know, he was in a car with him when he played, uh, I think it was Women and Children first. So y'all, you guys had contact with Eddie as as a young, not famous person all the way through, you know, like you did. You went to 2015 to the last. Yeah, and like I say, neither of us would say we were close friends at all, but they did know who we were. And so, yes, that is true. There was all these little chapters that we, that we would think about of where we were with him that I would talk to you before about his Univox Echo and his hot rod pickups, you know, working at a, at a backyard party, fucking with a pickup, even though he was going to play, he, he had a, it was another guitar. So, but anyway, the answer to that is yes. And Carl's got his stories too, you know, uh, oh, they're the same kind of like, especially looking back now, you're like, that's really, really fun that that happened, you know? Well, that, did he, did to you, did he change much? Did Eddie change much? From the beginning to, to the last well, it, with so in, in other words, with our interactions with him, yeah, yeah, like dude, when he the way he he wasn't famous when you met him, but then he was famous in eighty eight. You know, you know, it's weird. It's it's weird, but and, and so so I, I'm going to say no, not really. We we'd all gone to see them. I, I had a girlfriend with me at the time. We're going. They just told us that there's this is at the forum. There's a big fucking party, at, and this is before Martin Crew. This is Body Shop Van Halen are at the Body Shop, not Motley Crew. Huge fucking thing. We go down there, Jeff. I'm I, see now. I'm just. This is just about me. Forget it. This is not. This is not a Jeff video anymore. This is Gary video now. He fucking. I'm there with Volpe, I think, and this my girlfriend at the time, and another guy. I don't know if it was Carl. Pack. Everybody's trying to get in, just like in a fucking movie, like a fucking Sean Penn movie. Everybody's like, "Can I get in?" There's a, a large line out of side. There's a big party going inside the body shop, which is. I might still be there. I don't know. I haven't been. Everybody's way out in front, but there's the door is open at the front of the body shop. At least, at least it was then. There's no closed door. It's open, like the entrance. Mayhem, right? Because the Van Halen at their peak party at the body shop. From from my from my right to left, with his you know poodle haircut, Eddie walks by. He turns. He looks out. He sees me. He comes outside. He picks me up in front of all my girlfriend, my other friends. I think Volpe carries me into the fucking thing of which of course I stayed. Once I got inside, he didn't stay with me very long. He was off. Right. But he came because everybody's waiting. Can we get into this thing? He carries me. And my girlfriend got in like 
45 minutes later. And, and I, and, and just to say, I didn't marry her. <laughs> it's all a true story. He doesn't know my name. He doesn't look at me and go, Gary, never, but he always knows my face. And he fucking came out and picked me up in front of my friends that were there. Some other Van Halen fans that we had all gone to the show and, and just, so that's all. Once I got inside, it, it was another couple of minutes and then he was gone. He was always pulled out all every direction that Steve Rosen talks about in his book. Yeah. You know, concert in 79, I think it was. And of course, by then he had kind of broken the, the world and, and everybody wanted a piece to, to talk to him and meet him. And so what I was going to say too, was like when you said, had he changed? Yeah. And it's like I, I, this. And then you said it was before he was famous and everything. It, it's, it's, this is another cliche probably, but it's just like this whole Van Halen culture I'm talking about. He was fucking famous then. And we already had that same dynamic between us. It was larger than life. I, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's just like, you play, he's going to play, they're going to play Lagrange. And, and at that time, you know, just like, I, I think, I think of him, I, I think I talked to you about, about this the last time as a guy who probably with his breakthrough moments on guitar really must have really been fun and exciting for him too. Not just as his fans, you know, I, that's a cliche, but he was, he, you know, they, they were already dressing like when they would play, like we would all dress in our mom's blouses or whatever we thought was cool, but they had like these, the bitch in his fucking, you know, at least in that genre of music, which was like hard rock music, if not metal, but pop music right and the way that they would dress would be like look at his outfit <laughs> you know what i mean we would notice that as much too look at that black short silk jacket that i know is jimmy page inspired but they're doing their own little twist on it you know what i mean and it was just like right i mean you know it, it, for i get for the time it was probably pretty damn cool it, it was i mean I, i'm telling you <laughs> those guys who, who wanted to be fans but also Everybody <laughs> had guitars and were trying to do their own, you know, versions, just like they were when they saw ZZ Top. Right, right, right. So it, it was so cool, and I, and that it goes into that whole thing about about um, Roth and how everybody, you know, what I mean, every everybody was was so. It, it, I, I hate these cliches. It's like, but it's just like everybody was just so like rose to the occasion, right. and. And like they just felt the energy and they felt when they're playing those songs, you know, I got When I think about what Roth, what, what Roth, you think about every fucking melody line that Roth drove, drove in, you don't, you don't, that's what, that's what you're a fan of. Even if you, even if you're a guitar nut, like we are, you're really a fan of the whole thing. Sure. Well, I was, I've said this many times about Roth's ability to drop in these melodies on top of Eddie's music. Oh, and, how, and how how any other person would have dro dropped these in like for example three for example three right. is a good example okay so would Roth, Halen three, the album Van Halen three yeah would would Roth, had Roth been on that album would we have seen a better melodic take on the vocals you know than what we had because I I kind of feel like I don't know if this is true I just it's kind of what I've read over the years but Eddie had a lot of, lot to do with every aspect of that. And, uh, it, 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 yeah, it had to have come out much different, and not with any Roth dynamic at all, right? Right, it's the way I feel. It's when I hear I the, when I hear the vocal. Now, it's, you know, take Unchained. You know, when he's doing that that weird off time thing, and he's dropping in all these lyrics on top of it, it's like who would have even felt that melody? You know, Roth had yeah. a, he had a way of this is a, the genius of the two of them is and with Alex and Mike is the way they could play these crazy pieces and Roth could make it the coolest freaking song you ever heard. Yeah. That, that's, what, that's, 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 that, that's what created the culture because it, it wasn't just Engve or something, which I love all that shit, but it was just like, it wasn't just the virtuoso heavy rock thing. It was, it was what, it was what we're talking about. It was this whole culture that was, it was more than a band and it was, and it affected it affected it affected you to and, and, and especially if you thought you knew them a little bit like wow look at me <laughs> you know it's like it you know and, and they, they and what they would do is they would kind of create the illusion of yeah you know us even though we weren't friends you know but they created those moments you know that they knew they knew because because you know why because they could feel it they could feel the fucking magic well yeah you know you know you've been in bands long enough to know this and and 
it, you you know, not that any you know there were any Van were any Van Halen people, but or anything like that. But when you get in, a, in certain bands with certain people, there's a chemistry that happens. Yeah, and and to my from what I have felt through the years with different people is that when you get the right combination, it just works, man. You know, and I, yeah. and like you have alluded to the entire discussion. It's like, as if that was when they hit that, that combination, it just happened. You know, and, and you, and you know, it's funny and, and, and as you talk about that, when we're, when you asked me about seeing them in the backyard and, and, and the mammoth of Genesis, it was, more, it was more mammoth that I saw. I think Genesis was, I think I started to see him more as mammoth. Mm -hmm. And then to, to, and then to see them literally weeks after Roth had joined. I, I can remember us all talking with Dave in front while everybody's loading their equipment up and going like, you can, you can help me here. I don't know what their name was then. Were they still, they could have still been mammoth and they were discussing names because, because I remember Dave going, I don't know about the name Van Halen because people will think it's a Jolly Roger on a Dutch pirate. That's just, this is Roth. And I'm like, and like, yeah, yeah, maybe so, you know, but then Santana Montrose, you know, we're, they were just, I don't know what the time is, Jeff, but the, with that, but even that was my point is that the band was so different with him. They were so fucking different. There was, it was, I'm telling you, if it wasn't for Roth, it would just be, there's another bitching guitar player. Right. He's fucking, He's a bitching guitar player. There's, there's another Zach Wild, or you know, but right. oh, my, oh my god! But it, it was it was there right then, and so we saw that too, you know. Oh, anyway. you you just said that you heard Roth batting around the name. I guess That's, I, I I was part of the discussion with I don't remember who else. And he's just like they're going to change the name. Roth in the band. I don't remember the timeline because then people can check and go, no, that didn't happen that way. But it it did to some extent. I don't know exactly the time, but they just changed it. Or they were gonna change it, and they played the battle of the bands, and they, and they could have been. They were probably called Mammoth, but Roth was already singing. Okay. And they were gonna change the name soon, but but most of us that that was Roth who was being very pragmatic. But most of us are like Van Halen. That's cool, <laughs> you know. Because we know it's a bitching guitar player. It's like yeah, that, that's cool. You know, we all thought it was a good. Because you know, Roth would say today it was all his idea, of course, and and that's kind of how it's gone down in history. Uh, but if you know, of course he's going to kick it around. I think, and, and yeah, but it was yeah. interesting that you said he, he thought it was what, like some sort of. What did he think? What did, what was he thinking about the? Yeah, well, you, you can see the interview of him where he's like they, they wanted to call it Rat Salad, but they you think that was a Black Sabbath tribute band or something. But I had this experience with Roth. It wasn't like it was him and me, but there was a group of us, and we were listening to them, and they were. Either they had just changed it, maybe then, and maybe it said Van Halen on the thing, or they were gonna, they, or they were gonna change it in the next week. I swear to God. So, and it, it, it but it wasn't too far away from when Roth joined the band that they changed their name. But yeah, I don't right. remember exactly when right. or why. You know. It did, but you said a minute ago that Roth said it was something he thought it was like Jolly Roger. What? He, he was considering that. Yeah, he was like, uh, or or. Somebody said that. Now, I, you know, I don't even know if that was Roth, but I just remember there was a discussion about the name. What, what's the best name? Right. You know, right. and then it's just, isn't that funny? Because as you talk about us, we can't think of, I told you this the last time we talked, we can't think of any other way to think of Van Halen and all the other people that I hear talking. There's, everybody's such a fan. And, you know, and Pete Thorne and all these guys that were, that were, that weren't around when, and, living this dynamic that we're talking about we it's a you have you have a different perception than we do we, we it affected our perception of every other guitar player in the world every other band in the world there's this whole thing about really being with him when he's fucking with his pickup and and these little moments or carl going into his house to pick up in a, a cabinet or just all these moments that you were talking about that i think would be different if i was from toronto you know, right, right, right. I think I think you can get into it and find out the history, but they we were we were just in the middle of this fucking transitional thing, of right. of music that was better than anything we'd heard. I mean, I know it's sacrilege to say I I know about Led Zeppelin. They're fucking great. They're the fucking most iconic. But there was a, there was an aspect of Van Halen that was just like that that for us surpassed Led Zeppelin or or you name it 
or bad company or fog hat or you know Ted New. Uh, I'm not knocking. I'm not. I don't want to knock anybody. I'm not. No, 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 no. no. Ted, Ted yeah. It's just like uh, Nugent was the guy for me. Like he's the fucking best guitar player I've ever heard. But then going with Eddie and just seeing sort of a reinvention of guitar play was quite substantial. I'm not bettering or you know, I'm not comparing. I'm just saying I love fucking Ted Nugent. But, yeah, but, the, but that what you're saying, you know, and, and just, you know, is the shift. There's a shift that happens. Yeah. This period when you guys, you know, like I said, I was a little late to that shift, but you guys were there in the middle of this shift. You but, saw a local band that was go, that was better in your mind than most of the people that are out there currently and kind of a, a whole new thing. And you and I, and, but I, I just from talking to you, I know you understand that you understand that dynamic and you can feel that. Well, I've been with you, have, you have it in your own way. You know, you have your own version of that. You know, but yeah, but I've also I've also spent all the time talking to you guys in Pasadena. <laughs> yeah, right. That, yeah, that's what's fun about this. You yeah, know, and Greg, of course, Greg adds so much to this conversation because of yeah, that. yeah, yeah. He would he would have some some angle like that. That's right. You're fucking right about that. I didn't even think about that. But yeah. but I I still think just from talking to you just tonight, I, I think I've. I've hit on the essence of what I what is I think is fun to relate about the band, and because you, because you're asking me this stuff, and it's just like, okay, I want to tell that story because that's I know that's a personal story, but this one isn't, and this one sort of explains. And but they were it's so cliche. This is way before Eddie passed away. When, when I when I would think about because I have my little momentos, just a couple, not not you know not a not I don't have band I don't have momentos of of any of my bands or or them necessarily a lot, but I have the picture. The one that you have, the one of me at 5150. All right, I'll put that in here. And, and, and I swear to God, it sounds so cliche because I know people have other stories. I have I have Roth stories that aren't like this, you know, because we're from around here. And it's just like every time that there was that thing where, where you were a one-on-one -on -one or something, it, it, it was unbelievable. Like when he picked me up and carried me in front of all these people, I was just like, I was like, yeah, <laughs> you know, I couldn't believe it. I, I, I still kept, you know, and, 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 but he was so sweet, and and I know that comes up probably a lot, a lot of interviews. But but he was so sweet, but d definitely has his opinion on shit. I, I 